All right, we are live. Uh, hello, everyone, and again, we are together with uh, together with you for uh, our YR webinar series. Uh, for, for a webinar, uh, basically a part of the YR webinar series. As you know that YR webinars are back, so we actually wanted to organize two sessions before our YR global conference. So today we are having the second one and with a valuable guest and who is Ipecular, Dr. Ipecular. Uh, she's from, she's right now living in Belgium and so having biosystem related research researches and then she's using R. Today she's going to talk about uh, her studies. But before starting, I would like to also have a kind reminder regarding our conference. And I would like to quickly share my screen and then just do some reminders, kind reminders to you. Uh, so basically our Conference page is already simulated, researched, updated as you know. And then she's using as you know this. Today she's going to and talk then, about uh, her studies. But before starting, I would like to also have a kind reminder regarding our conference. Sorry for that. So curse of the live session. Uh, so probably you heard me. You know, I was repeating myself, but it was coming from you. Sorry for that. All right. So. Yeah, exactly. So we are having our conference uh, next Friday and there will be a conference, uh, in, you know, during our conference, there will be talks, invited speakers uh, will be coming and uh, that we will have keynotes, discussion panels. Uh, so you can take a look at uh, if real detailed information about our conference on our web page. So here you can find information about our keynotes. Uh, so we will be also announcing um, result of to uh, our grants. So basically, uh, as you probably know that we uh, we started a call for grants. So the first one was uh, regarding uh, women and data science. And the second one was community award. And then we will be also sharing with you the results. Um, so yeah, our program is already there. So please take a look at that. And then hopefully see you next Friday during our conference. All right, so I think we can turn back to our webinar. And then again, uh, I would like to first of all introduce you our valuable guest. So today, as I told you, uh, we have really valuable, um, valuable speaker together with us. So she's working in uh, Belgium, in KU Leeuwen. And then, so she's working on biostatistics and today she's going to talk about her studies. Um, so I would like to pass the stage to Ipek and I don't want to take your time. Uh, so please don't hesitate to ask her questions. So you can ask her questions on YouTube chat. Uh, so after the talk, I will be picking up those questions and then passing them to our speaker. So then our speaker will be also answering your questions. So please don't hesitate to, hesitate to ask your questions and just keep asking. Okay, I will stop talking and then uh, letting Ipek start her talk. And see you and enjoy. Yeah. Thank you so much for a nice presentation. Hello, everyone. Um, and also, I really want to thank to the uh, YR Foundation for the kind invitation for the webinar. Um, my name is Ipek Gular, and um, my research lied on joint models for longitudinal and survival data for years uh, between University of Santiago de Compostela from Spain and Hazelt University from Belgium. Um, then I worked for several years as a biostatistics, biostatistics consultant, and currently I'm working in Leuven Biostatistics and Statistical Bioinformatics Center in Catholic University of Leuven, Belgium. 
Um, Michael will be uh, on joint modeling approaches, uh, which are proposed to study longitudinal and survival data together. Um, and we will focus on the recent developments and new extensions because joint models actually are gaining lots of attention recently. And uh, it's a very interesting topic to study longitudinal and survival to get data togetherly. And there are really, um, recently there are really new application studies, uh, recent developments, new extensions on this. And still we have uh, research questions. So we will focus on the new extensions and also the some uh, research questions that still has to be uh, proposed or has to be studied. Um, so in many follow-up studies in biomedical research, uh, they produce different type of outcomes and one can be time to events data. Uh, which can be right censored or left censored. And also we have, uh, we could have some repeated measurements, which is called longitudinal data. Um, and the main aim is um, in the many biomedical uh, studies is to study the, um, to explore the association between the time to events data and the longitudinal data. So what the clinicians mostly would like to see is the effect of the longitudinal trajectories uh, taken during the follow-up a patient, um, the effect of them in a time to event of interest, which can be patient survival or any event of interest. Um, so why we call joint models and why we have to jointly model this to uh, different outcomes, the survival, the time to event data, and the longitudinal data. First of all, when we have the follow-up study and we have the longitudinal and survival, the time to event data together, the longitudinal process, the repeated measurements, uh, are affected by informative censoring, which is also called dropout process. So when we follow a patient during time, we have uh, the repeated measurements, but when he or she observed the event of interest, um, we no longer have uh, the repeated, the corresponding repeated measurements to evaluate the trajectory for the for the probability of the event. So this is missing this non at random. So uh, we have to deal with it, and uh, this is called also informative censoring, and we have to take into account while modeling the longitudinal data. So that's why the joint model approaches are really important to uh, correctly model the longitudinal data affected by informative censoring. And also, as I mentioned before, the main goal is to study the association between the longitudinal and, and the time to event data. And um, one way to do that is to incorporate uh, the longitudinal data as a covariate in the survival process or any events of interest in the time to event model. Um, recently, um, like in the in the first steps uh, to study longitudinal survival process together in the literature, um, the extended Cox model has been proposed, including uh, time varying coefficients, uh, including the repeated measurements into the uh, survival model. Then two stage approaches and joint model joint modeling approaches have been proposed. Um, I will focus in this talk. I will focus also in the two stage approaches, which is actually. Um, a prior method uh, to the joint modeling approaches, but we will take an advantage of, uh, of also the two-stage approaches for computational feasibility. Um, and I also indeed will illustrate it with a biomedical uh, application and uh, also the joint modeling approaches. So um, the main idea is uh, between the two-stage approaches, um, is to, first of all, indeed, we want to model the longitudinal data and the survival data. The longitudinal data can be uh, modeled uh, with the existing uh, regression models for longitudinal data in the literature, like linear mixed models. Um, so we first, in stage one, we first model the longitudinal data, the repeated measurements using linear mixed models. And then in the second stage, we can use any survival model for the time to events data. But the main idea of two stage approaches is to uh, model them separately in a separate likelihood calculation. Here, we're not taking into account the dropout process. So 
That's why the joint modeling, the joint likelihood is important. And here we don't uh, take into account the dropout process in the, in the longitudinal data. So we have to be careful and, and use some corrections in here. In joint modeling approaches, we would like to link the longitudinal and survival model together somehow. And this, is, can, be, this can be done with joint likelihood calculation. So first we have uh, the longitudinal model, the longitudinal process affected by informative censoring indeed. And then we have the survival process, which includes the uh, longitudinal data as a covariate. And then we link them together with a latent random effect in the joint likelihood calculation. Um, there are different approaches um, to link between uh, to to link the survival and longitudinal submodel. So, um, for instance, uh, there are selection models where the latent random effect underlines only the longitudinal submodel. And then we have a conditional distribution of survival, the con um, conditional likelihood of survival with the longitudinal process. In the pattern mixture models, the latent random effect only underlines the survival model. Shared random effect models is, uh, includes the latent random effect both in longitudinal and survival model. Uh, we will focus on shared random effect models because it's uh, commonly used in uh, joint model approaches. Um, so as a summary, we have the longitudinal submodel, which can have uh, a corresponding risk factor covariates in the model. And also we have a survival model, which includes the uh, fixed parameters, um, any risk factors for, for, for survival. Um, and we link them together with the latent random effects. So um, in, in detail, we use linear mixed effects models for longitudinal submodel, as I mentioned before. A simple uh, linear mixed effects model would be a random intercept and random slope model, where we include the random intercept and random slope. And this is actually the random effect, the latent random effect that we link the longitudinal and survival slope model together. Um, this, this, is, uh, this link can uh, be um, one of the ways to link the survival and longitudinal submodel, and I will show the other options uh, in the um, later slides. So, in survival slope model, what we do is that incorporate those random effects, which are the random intercept and random slope in this case, in a simple model. Uh, we incorporate it as a, another covariate here, and the alpha is the um, parameter, the association parameter, which is um, which reflects the association between the repeated measurements and survival data. So we can uh, we can have an interpretation of an effect of longitudinal biomarker in the in the Cox proportion hazard model. Indeed, we can use any other uh, time to event models here, but specifically, uh, I mentioned here Cox proportion hazard regression model, which can be done with survival uh, package in R, and linear mixed effects models can be fitted in NLME. Mm, our package. So, um, as I told you, that's one of the simple way which would be the random intercept and random slope, and then get the random effects predictions at time t and incorporate them into the survival slope model. Um, this is one of the simplest association between the longitudinal and survival uh, slope model, but there are different uh, way of um, to get the association between them. So we call it different parameterizations. Um, the other uh, commonly used parameterization is the true unobserved value at time t. So what we do is that we predict the longitudinal biomarker that the patient would have at time t. Time t is the, um, the time of the event observed. So we predict uh, with the fixed effects and then the random effects, we predict um, the repeated measure at time t, and we incorporate it into the survival submodel, also with the alpha parameter, which reflects the association between the true unobserved value at time t and um, the probability of having that event of, um, of, event of interest. Um, the other possibility is to incorporate 
both current value, but also the slope of trajectory of longitudinal biomarker. This is very important because um, the clinician may not be interested only the true value of the repeated measurement at time t, but also the history, also the trajectory of that patient. What, what, does, what was the trajectory during whole follow-up? So um, indeed, the true value is also predicted by this trajectory, but they, uh, ha they can have an additional information with both current value and the slope of trajectory at time t. So um, this can be uh, done with the um, derivative of the um, true value with an other association parameter indeed. So the alpha two can be can capture the situations in which at a specific time point, two patients show similar true marker levels at time t, but they may differ in the rate of change of the, of the marker. So uh, the alpha two can be interested in, uh, in, this, um, in such um, examples. And the other parameterization would, uh, can be a cumulative effect, including the whole area under the trajectory, which is uh, simply the um, integral of the true um, unobserved value at time t. And uh, this is also interesting when we have nonlinear trajectories indeed, uh, specifically when we have uh, a curve of a longitudinal biomarker and we want to see actually the whole area under the trajectory, the effect of the area under the uh, curve uh, to the probability of the time to event of interest. So as I mentioned before, in, sh in shared random effect models, uh, we underline the latent random effect for both longitudinal and survival data in this way. So we calculate the joint likelihood calculation. And therefore, we avoid um, the problems uh, from the uh, informative censoring dropout process in the longitudinal data. And also we can link the survival and longitudinal data together. So uh, this is the main idea of joint modeling approaches and uh, there exist different packages in R I will show you right now, but I want to focus uh, this talk on the research questions and some extensions of joint modeling for longitudinal and survival data. Um, until a very uh, close time, um, the joint modeling approaches uh, were only dealing with one single longitudinal biomarker and survival data. Uh, there were different parameterizations, there were dynamic predictions and so on, but uh, indeed there are still um, so much research questions that we can find, um, especially as a biostatistics consultant, um, we really um, find um, really complex data with uh, multiple longitudinal biomarkers, not only one longitudinal biomarker, but multiple ones. And indeed, the clinicians want to see the link between all those longitudinal biomarkers with the survival. Um, so the first research questions would be, and like uh, now they have some answers in there, um, correlated multiple longitudinal biomarkers. So uh, in many biomedical studies, actually, when they follow up the patient, they don't produce one longitudinal biomarker, but multiple longitudinal biomarkers. And indeed, we don't know the correlation between them, and they can be correlated to each other. And indeed, we have to take into account this correlation. And also, we are interested in the effect of all those longitudinal biomarkers to the sur patient survival. Um, so um, this is also a, one of the research questions that has been um, really developing in the recent years in joint modeling approaches. I will show an example uh, for you. And actually, uh, at the end, I will focus on the correlated multiple launches and biomarkers and survival data. Um, we have also personalized dynamic predictions for time to events data in joint modeling approaches, which is which I want to highlight in here, which is very interesting. Um, which is also like an advantage of joint modeling approaches. Um, the, um, the time to events, the probability of having an event of interest actually depends on the repeated measurements because we link together and we have an effect of longitudinal biomarker to time to events data. So if we um, have some 
models and predictions for time to events data. That means that if we continue follow that patient, that patient has a new repeated measurement, has a new longitudinal biomarker measurement, we have to update his or her probability of having an event of interest. This can be done by personalized dynamic predictions for time to events data. So the clinicians have a um, have really a fancy prediction tool uh, for each patient and for each uh, repeated measurement that they take uh, over time while they follow the patient up. Um, the other research question is that the uh, simple longitudinal, uh, simple joint models for longitudinal survival data always light on uh, uh, one event and uh, yeah, it's commonly survival. But indeed, we can have uh, the event of interest can be competing risks or multi-state models that has to be dealt with spatial uh, time to event models indeed. Um, the other research questions is that the longitudinal biomarker or the longitudinal biomarkers that we are working on has nonlinear trajectories over time. So it means that we need flexible methods in the um, longitudinal model, in the linear mixed effects model. Um, also, we can have nonlinear effects in Cox proportional hazard model, which is also which also needs very flexible methods in Cox proportional hazard model, and has to deal with uh, with um, specific models and specific uh, solicitations. Um, so, uh, for each research questions, I will talk about some R packages and some extensions that is already done in the literature, and. As I told you before, we, I'll focus on the multivariate longitudinal data, which is also like uh, very interesting in the recent years. Um, so for multiple longitudinal data, we have uh, in the literature, um, we have some Bayesian uh, models proposed uh, within a Bayesian framework. Um, which deals with multivariate longitudinal, correlated multivariate longitudinal data, and then their effect on survival analysis or time to event data. But also we have, we can use the um, GM bias 2 package for this, for biasing models for multivariate longitudinal and survival data. I will give an example uh, with the quote uh, in it at the end of the talk today. Um, also, we have join RML package, uh, which also uh, can fit uh, multiple longitudinal data with survival. And uh, we have uh, also two stage approaches used um, to deal with actually high dimensional multivariate and longitudinal data. I will also focus on this because uh, it, when we have a high dimensional multiple longitudinal data, there we have a computational um, issues and it's um, not always very feasible to, to build a joint models uh, for high dimensional multivariate longitudinal and survival data. That's why we will go for two stage approaches with a correction indeed for um, the dropout process in the longitudinal data, the informative censoring to take into account that uh, dropout process in the longitudinal data. Dynamic predictions for time to events data can be done using GM and GM bias packages. Um, introduced by Dimitris Rizopoulos. Uh, if someone is uh, interested in joint models, you, you already know his name. Um, so uh, they have, uh, yeah, they produce dynamic predictions and they also have a shiny tool uh, to get the dynamic predictions, a very fancy shiny tools uh, to get the dynamic predictions. Uh, the competing risks on time to events data can be dealt with GM bias two package, which is an new version of GM bias package indeed, which includes competing risks uh, for, for time to event data. Um, for nonlinear longitudinal trends, actually we can use GM bias, GM bias two packages with cubic supplines, with natural splines, using natural supplines. But if we need some more complex solicitations in the, some uh, more complex flexible methods for nonlinear longitudinal trends, um, indeed, uh, we have to go for two-stage modeling approaches also. And if we have one single longitudinal biomarker, we can also use uh, the GM package because the GM package, the 
GM, only with GM. This package was only one single longitudinal biomarker and survival data and their extensions. Um, for nonlinear effects in Cox proportion hazard model, there is nothing uh, proposed in joint modeling approaches. Um, I have worked on it for two stage modeling approaches using MGCV uh, package, um, which produce um, nonlinear effects, um, which uh, allows to put nonlinear covariates in the Cox proportion hazard model. And then, yeah, two stage modeling approaches are useful to, to get uh, also flexibility in the survival sub model. Um, so I will talk about the um, computational problems, computational issues when we have high dimensional multivariate longitudinal data. We, uh, it's worthwhile to mention because, um, yeah, recently uh, there are uh, different models proposed in the literature to deal with uh, multivariate longitudinal and survival data. So in case of that, we have um, a random effect just as a simple case, we have uh, only random intercepts for each longitudinal biomarker. And then we have K longitudinal biomarkers and we have K random intercepts, uh, which are uh, demonstrated with U in, in here. What we want to do is to get a multivariate normal distribution to assume that it's multivariate normal distribution of this random intercepts for K random intercepts. But indeed, in the real life, we don't have only random intercepts, but slopes also. So, but in the simple case, even in a simple case, uh, with a K um, longitudinal biomarker and K random intercepts, uh, sometimes it's um, um, computationally um, problematic to get the multivariate normal distribution. So when dimensionality of U increases, with the number of outcomes model indeed, the integration in the conditional distribution here for each longitudinal biomarker would be also uh, high dimensional and get uh, problematic. So in the joint likelihood calculation in the high dimensional models, in the joint likelihood calculation of all longitudinal biomarkers and survival data, we have some computational, we could have some uh, computational issues. Actually, the GM bias two package deals with uh, four longitudinal biomarker, five longitudinal biomarkers with uh, random intercept and slopes, even with uh, cubic suppliance methods uh, with some nonlinear effects of longitudinals. But we don't know how far we can get. Um, and also when we have very high dimensional data, we don't know um, how far we can get and we, don't, we are not sure if we will have some computational issues. And also the duration of the uh, fitting of the model uh, would be very high indeed. Um, so that's why I also want, would like to mention here the use of another uh, strategy to deal with multivariate longitudinal data and survival data. This is based on um, two-stage modeling approaches. It's not a joint mo joint modeling approaches, but uh, the multi the dimensionality, the high dimensionality problems in multivariate longitudinal data is dealt with a pairwise approach, which I will uh, present it right now with details. And um, the computational problems are are um, solved with pairwise approach, and then uh, the link between the longitudinal uh, data and survival data is done with two-stage modeling, indeed with some corrections for um, informative censoring. There, this is two uh, papers, uh, which is, uh, this is uh, our paper uh, for two-stage to the use of pairwise approach in two-stage model for multivariate longitudinal and survival data with an application to nephrology research which I'll also show you here in this talk. Uh, and then the other um, interesting paper, very interesting paper is the pairwise estimations of multivariate longitudinal outcomes in a Bayesian setting with extensions to the joint model. So here we, uh, what they use is the pairwise approach in a Bayesian framework and um, they do it uh, and they, they link the, all the longitudinal biomarkers with the survival. 
Um, so let's uh, have a look with all uh, packages, R packages for join models. Uh, first, first we have join R uh, package, which allows one longitudinal and survival data when, with only random effects parameterization. Uh, it doesn't allow any other parameterizations. Um, then we have join RML, which is also interesting and allows joint models for multiple longitudinal and survival data with Monte Carlo expectation maximization. Um, this is also, uh, we don't know how far we can get with the multivariate, how many longitudinal biomarker we can use. And uh, in a high dimensional setting, um, what uh, how far we can get, uh, we're not sure about it. Um, there is a GM package uh, by Dimitri Sisopoulos, as I mentioned before, which allows one longitudinal and survival data with different parameterizations. Um, we have GM bias, um, which directly implements the MCMC and allows also for categorical longitudinal data, because uh, mostly we always use the continuous longitudinal data, but uh, indeed we can have uh, binary longitudinal data as well, and um, also allows for general transformation functions in here. The GM bias 2 package which is an extension of GM bias package, allows multiple longitudinal outcomes of mixed type, which can be categorical or continuous, um, and also multiple events, as I mentioned before, which can be competing risks, multi-state process, and so on. And the pairwise approach um, for multivariate longitudinal data, which uh, is very useful for high dimensional data, uh, can be done actually, it's, it's proposed in uh, SAS, but can be done in R, of course. I will show you uh, some uh, way to, um, to uh, apply the pairwise approach in R. Um, so I will talk about an illustration right now, and I will talk about the, uh, the pairwise approach and two-stage modeling and how we can do it uh, in R. And also with this database, I will show you the code of GM bias 2 package. So we will fit uh, a multivariate longitudinal data and survival data together um, using both two-stage modeling approach and joint modeling approaches. So um, the motivating database are uh, database that we uh, used for um, multivariate longitudinal survival data was peritoneal dialysis program from um, um, Central Hospital of Porto. Um, the patients follow up between uh, 1999 and 2013. We have some baseline characteristics as age and gender. Um, we have the events, which is forced that the patient abandoned the treatment program, time to kidney failure uh, with 66.88 sensor times. The median follow-up time was 27.4 months. And we have, uh, at, um, at last, we have four longitudinal biomarkers, which are correlated. And we would like to see, the clinicians would like to see their effects on the kidney failure. So the main objective is to study the association between the longitudinal biomarkers, the calcium, PTH, creatinine, and phosphorus measurements, and then see their effects on the kidney failure and the survival process. Um, what we know from the literature is that the low albumin levels indeed is usually associated with kidney failure. Albumin is another longitudinal biomarker that we are not uh, using it right now, but we have calcium levels uh, of the blood may drop when kidney fails. And uh, we also know that calcium, PTH, creatinine, and phosphor phosphorus measurements are highly correlated to each other. So uh, if we just uh, overview the longitudinal biomarkers, we see that some of them are, um, they have the uh, nonlinear trajectories, especially creatinine levels have nonlinear trajectories, which has to be dealt uh, indeed with um, nonlinear um, longitudinal submodel with uh, flexible uh, methods. Um, so the multivariate longitudinal model uh, what we have to do is that we assume um, 
a simple linear mix effects models uh, correlate with correlated random intercept and slope. And what we want to do is that for key equal to four, for four longitudinal biomarker, what we want to do is to assume multivariate normal distribution in random effects. Um, so in a high dimensional methods in a high dimensional settings, uh, it, this approach is very useful and it's proposed uh, by uh, Fusion Peke, um, um, which like uh, recently it's very useful for a multivariate longitudinal model only to use for correlation between the multivariate longitudinal data uh, and also between uh, very uh, different types of longitudinal uh, data. Um, so here, what we do is that actually, uh, as also the name says to us, we, we fit um, bivariate longitudinal data for each pair. And then um, pairwise fitting approach maximize all pairwise likelihoods. We have likelihood for each pair separately for key um, multiply by key minus one divided by two pairs. This is the, um, the number of pairs that we could have with K longitudinal biomarkers. So we have, we lead to pair specific parameter estimates. For each pair, we have different parameter estimations. And then we average these parameters uh, and then we obtain the, uh, the average corresponding estimates for all uh, longitudinal biomarkers. Um, the asymptotic multivariate normal distribution is given by sandwich estimator. They call it sandwich estimator in here. So G, J is a block diagonal matrix with diagonal blocks and K is a symmetric matrix containing blocks, K, P, Q. And in the final step, estimates for the parameters can be calculated by taking average overall pairs. So just we assume the sandwich estimator of um, variance covariance matrix and the average of each estimate, the fixed parameter estimates, um, and also the random effects estimations can be done by averaging all the pairs, uh, which is uh, quite simple. And uh, then we incorporate each longitudinal biomarker, the K longitudinal biomarker with K association parameter and K uh, parameterization. This parameterization can be done uh, with different options that I have mentioned before in the beginning. And we incorporate them uh, into the survival model in the, in the second stage. And indeed here, we, the predictions of uh, longitudinal biomarkers can have uh, affected by informative censoring dropout process. That is why we need to correct somehow these um, estimations. Um, so for this association, as I mentioned before, we can use the true unobserved value at time t, time dependent slopes, including both current value and the slope of trajectory at time t, or the cumulative area, the whole area under the trajectory also. Um, so uh, in the pairwise approach by uh, Fius and Verbecke is implemented actually in SAS. Um, but also we can do it with, uh, with R, uh, with MVGLMER package, and the function that we can um, fit the multivariate longitudinal models with different types of longitudinal biomarkers indeed. They don't have to be uh, continuous. Here I have an example of uh, four continuous variables, but uh, it can be also uh, with different uh, families. So what we do is that uh, for each pair, for calcium creatinine, for calcium phosphor, uh, for calcium PTH, creatinine phosphor, phosphor PTH, we fit uh, bivariate longitudinal data, which can be uh, fit very easily and is computationally feasible when we have a high dimensional data. That's the uh, advantage of pairwise approaches actually. So uh, as we fit bivariate models only two, with only two longitudinal biomarkers, um, we don't uh, face any computational problems in here. And also this can be done by using different um, 
flexible methods for uh, longitudinal data. We can uh, use some naturist plants here, cubic plants, and so on, to um, get nonlinear trajectories of each uh, for each longitudinal uh, outcome. And here we can put for for indeed for creatinine um, a cubic spline as we have observed in the um, in the figure. So then we we will have um, the uh, models for each pair pairs. And what we do is that uh, we will get we have to write a code for for this because there is no package for that. Um, there is a macro in SAS, but in R it's not implemented yet, but it's so easy to, to get the uh, average of estimations, predictions, and the sandwich estimator indeed, uh, assuming the multivariate normal distribution with sandwich estimator. Um, so we get the average of predictions and we incorporate it into the survival sub model with different parameterizations. Uh, we can deal with um, any parameterization uh, for each longitudinal biomarker. One of the advantages of uh, two-stage approach is that we can use a different parameterization for each longitudinal biomarker. As uh, if we uh, turn back to this graphic, I can be interested uh, that the uh, whole trajectory of whole area under the curve of creatinine uh, instead of the true unobserved value of creatinine at time t. And for the calcium, I can all, yeah, I can only be interested in true, uh, true uh, value at time t, but for creatinine, uh, I would be interested in the uh, whole area under the trajectory, under the curve. So this can be done also uh, by using two-stage approach and pairwise approach. So the same model can also fitted by using GM bias to package, um, which is also um, which also allows any parameterization type, uh, any um, um, flexible methods for longitudinal biomarker, not nonlinear longitudinal biomarkers, and uh, we fit a joint model in here. The thing is that in a high dimensional concept. Uh, can be uh, computationally very hard and very uh, the duration will be uh, very uh, long uh, to fit uh, the, um, the whole model, the whole joint model. Uh, but in this case, in this example, we can fit uh, with the GM bias 2 package uh, using um, different models for each calcium, creatinine, serica, phos phosphorus, and PTH levels for, for uh, each longitudinal biomarker. And here we can use different forms of them. So we can indeed use the uh, area under the curve for creatinine, the true value for calcio, we indicated in here as a list in the in this package. This is a very uh, like clear and uh, very nice package to understand and to fit the models very easily actually. And there are lots of options that we can use. Um, here we just say the forms of the parameterization, different parameterization for each longitudinal biomarker. And uh, yeah, for example, we can use the value and slope for each or the area for each. And what we do is that we make a list of these, all these models and we, fit a joint model with the uh, Cook's proportional hazard model. And uh, indeed here uh, we use the Bayesian, for in, we are in Bayesian framework and we use a joint model, a Bayesian joint model for long, multiple longitudinal and survival data. Um, as an overview of new extensions, I would like to um, just to make a summary. Um, Recently, we deal with multiple longitudinal biomarkers and uh, multivariate, long multivariate survival data within a joint modeling framework, which is very interesting for clinicians because normally we always observe um, multiple longitudinal data, multiple repeated measurements during the follow up studies. Um, the quadrat effect effects, cubic splines, natural cubic splines can be used for nonlinear trends of longitudinal biomarkers. Instead of, um, in case of uh, having, uh, or in case you want to use um, more complex spline methods, it's not yet implemented uh, in the R packages, but um, 
Indeed, for two-stage approaches, you can use the existing uh, spline methods for uh, each uh, longitudinal data and then incorporate them into the survival model. Um, we also so I have worked uh, with my colleagues. We have worked uh, this use of supply methods, the non um, use more flexible methods for multivariate longitudinal data, and we uh, we implemented implemented them in the pairwise approach. So now we are talking about non-linear multivariate longitudinal data and more flexible models. And also we have worked in uh, additive Cox models for survival data, just to see if there are some nonlinear effects in the Cox proportion hazard model, which can be also uh, very interesting. And it's also done uh, within a two-stage modeling approach, within a two-stage modeling uh, framework. And here are some selected references. And I want to uh, thank you for your attention and also for the organization. Perfect. So thank you so much, Ipek, for this uh, amazing presentation. So it was full of very useful information. And thanks a lot for coming and being with us and sharing your knowledge with us today. We have plenty of questions, actually, uh, on the YouTube chat. So I will be cool. picking them up. So the first question is from Martin, and the question is like that. What is the difference between informative and non-informative censoring? Could you also give some examples of informative and non-informative censoring? Um, actually, informative censoring is, uh, um, is when we can um, explain it with dropout process, which is a very common example. So uh, it's it's about um, I I yeah, uh, I would say uh, missing at random and missing non at random because one is missing at random and can be dealt uh, with uh, existing techniques. Uh, for example, uh, in the case of longitudinal data, the uh, missing at random is dealt with the linear mixed effects models with the, by the measurement error. So we don't have any problem for missing at random there for non-informative censoring. But in case of informative censoring uh, in the setting of a longitudinal data, repeated measurements data, what we have is a dropout process. So if a patient dies, we don't we don't have any more creatinine levels of that patient indeed. So, um, and, uh, but the, the, the follow-up study continues and we are actually predicting uh, the survival of 10 years, but the patients who died in fifth year, uh, we have no longer repeated measurements after that. So this missing is um, yeah, informative censoring and it has to be uh, dealt with modeling the probability of um, of the patients die in, in the time T and we don't have no longer repeated measurements data. So this is, a, this is a very clear example for informative censoring. Okay, so thanks for the answer. So let's move forward with the next one. What are the most recommended R packages for survival analysis, diagnostics and visualizations? Um, yeah, we have um, survival, yeah, survival uh, R package is the most uh, common one, but also, for example, I have mentioned MGCV package, uh, which is deal with additive Cox uh, proportional hazard model, which is also interested to deal with nonlinear effects and to see, uh, because, yeah, in, um, Commonly, we don't uh, check for nonlinear uh, effects in survival submodel, and it's. I think it's important also to to check the nonlinear effects with MGCV package. All right. So yeah, sure. Thanks a lot for the answer again. And um, another question is like this: accelerated failure time models have any applications for longitudinal data or joint models? Yes, yes. In GM package, GM bias package, all deals with accelerated failure time also. Yeah, it's 
it's it's from the beginning actually uh, in the also in the extended Cox models uh, propose uh, they have used accelerated failure time. So in all packages that I have mentioned, you have the accelerated failure okay. time. Package. Perfect, perfect, good to know. All right. So uh, another question regarding our packages again. Uh, do JM bias two or MGCB packages use bias in statistics approach? Uh, yes, uh, MGCB is not bias in in not within a biasing framework, but GM bias two indeed. It's uh, especially the actually GM bias package is semi biasing approaches, but GM bias two is a full biasing framework. They 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 use yeah. Okay, so thanks a lot for this as well. Another question is looking like that. Is it possible to calculate survival curves for longitudinal data? So the, yeah, maybe let's first answer this one because the question has uh, another part as well. So I will <laughs> continue with that one. Survival curves for longitudinal data, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so the question is, is it possible to calculate survival curves for longitudinal data? Uh, okay, I think you mean uh, using the longitudinal data information, can we have the survival uh, curves for the... Yeah, yeah I Or think, update, the yeah. update the survival <laughs> curve with the longitudinal data. Indeed, the joint model approaches deal with, with it. So this is why we use joint modeling approaches. So we have uh, indeed... Um, um, we can use only the... I think the question is for only one longitudinal biomarker, we draw the survival curve, the effect of the longitudinal biomarker. Yes, indeed, we can, we can do that in the whole joint modeling approaches. Okay, so thanks a lot. And so the last question is like this. What are the typical ways of determining the perform performance, diagnostics, and goodness of fit for two-stage models or joint models? Yeah, good question because I haven't mentioned uh, about the predictive accuracy uh, of the model's goodness of fitness. There are indeed um, also in GM uh, package, GM bias package, GM bias two package, uh, we have uh, diagnosis, uh, model diagnosis, uh, alternatives, model diagnosis, um, and also predictive accuracy with dynamic predictions, the rug curves of the model so that we how far we can uh, predict the patient's survival. Uh, this is also a very interesting um, uh, topic also in joint models. And for two-stage approaches, uh, we also use um, yeah, uh, um, time-dependent rug curves because for survival analysis, indeed, to, uh, for predictive accuracy of survival analysis, we use time-dependent rug curves. Uh, for two-stage approaches, also, we, uh, we use uh, these techniques to see how the longitudinal biomarker uh, predicts the survival. But also, two-stage approaches, yeah, there, there has been um, lots of simulation studies. I also uh, had to make lots of simulation studies because, indeed, in two-stage approaches, even we use some correction uh, for uh, informative censoring. We are not uh, dealing with that as joint likelihood calculation. So uh, the simulation studies show similar results with uh, in case of a correction in two-stage approaches. So um, yeah, can be uh, dealt with simulation studies to compare joint models and two-stage models. Okay, so thanks a lot for this one as well. And I'm checking once again our YouTube chat. I think, yeah, this was the last question. Um, so thanks a lot once again. And yeah, I, I personally really enjoyed. And so I also learned a lot <laughs> from you. And thanks a lot once again for being with us, sharing your knowledge. Um, so just I would like to remind our audience regarding our conference so next week on friday we're having our global conference why our global and so we will have very valuable 
in invited talks and then keynotes and also of course regular talks as well and we are also we will have a panel so which will be also very interesting i think for our audience and also it will be very important um so anything you would like to add or anything you would like to mention before we uh, you know close the session yeah thank you for the attention and for the kind invitation uh, i hope it's uh useful for someone who is working in joint models <laughs> and uh i of course uh always uh welcome any additional questions and comments on on this topic uh by email uh epic.guler uh, at kulove.b so thank you so much Great. So thanks a lot once again, and thanks a lot uh, for our thanks a lot to our audience as well. So you were together with us. It's almost 9 p.m. And so mm -hmm. have a great day and have a great evening or morning because we had also guests from um, like different parts of the world. So and then hope yeah. to see you next <laughs> week. <laughs> okay. So thanks a lot. Bye everyone. Bye bye.